If you or a loved one have been in a traffic accident recently, you need to check out Morgan & Morgan. With over 800 attorneys in 49 states, they're America's largest injury law firm, and they've so far recovered more than $13 billion for their clients. Their goal is to fight to get their clients the largest possible settlement following an injury and pride themselves on their maxim of for the people, not the powerful. With Morgan & Morgan, everything is completely free of charge unless they win your case. There are no upfront costs, no sign-up fees, and all the paperwork, research, expert witnesses, negotiations, and court hearings are completely free unless they win your case. If you don't win your case, you pay absolutely nothing. People are often apprehensive of personal legal action because it feels like they're taking money out of someone's pocket. But in the case of traffic accidents, when you sue for an injury, you're not suing the person who caused the injury. You're suing their insurance company who's sitting on billions of dollars. There's absolutely no reason for a person to feel guilty for getting the compensation they deserve. And Morgan & Morgan don't just focus on road accidents. They have attorneys who deal with workplace injuries, slips and falls, medical malpractice, and nursing home abuse meaning you should check them out no matter what kind of accident has befallen you. So, if you've ever been injured in an accident, go check out Morgan & Morgan, because their fee is free unless they win for you. For more information, go to forthepeople.com slash let's read, or dial pound law, that's pound 529, from your phone. In 1977, I had taken time off of work to have a baby and stay at home with her. Trouble was, I still needed an income, so my mother had hired my younger sister and me to do the dirty back-breaking work at her antique store while she took care of her first infant granddaughter. I know that might sound harsh, but it was an informal system that gave me a break from child-rearing while bringing in some extra money. One day, my sister and I were working together and my mom had just gotten a truckload of European oak furniture that needed to be cleaned and polished, so we were busy working away when a handsome young man walked into the store. He started talking to my sister, who was 16 at the time, introducing himself as Ted Smith. Our mom's maiden name was also Smith and it also happened to be the name of the antique store, so I remember my sister and the man having a good old laugh that we could all be related. He ended up picking up a big old armoire but said that he'd have to go get his truck since at the moment he was driving his VW Bug. But before he left, he asked my sister and me if we wanted to go out to dinner that night with him. We were sweaty and dirty from work, I had a baby to care for and sis already had a boyfriend so we both politely declined. Ted then asked me to ride with him to get his truck so he could drop off his Bug at the auto shop for repairs but by that point I had to go home to get to my infant right away because I was still nursing her and I thought my breasts were going to begin to leak at any moment. However, he wouldn't give up on trying to get one or both of us away from the shop. He said that he could come back at 10pm that evening for his armoire and asked whether one or both of us would be there. Again, we declined, telling him that we'd be closed and were busy after hours. But Ted was persistent and asked us about the next night. Once again, we told him no, so he switched to early morning, but by that stage we were so weirded out by his behavior that we told him that he'd have to just swing by during regular operating hours. In the end, he said he was sorry, but he couldn't buy the armoire if we couldn't be flexible. We hated to give up the sale, but after he had been there for over two hours, we thought that he was just looking and taking up our time. We still had a lot of work to do on the furniture that had just arrived in the shop, and finally... We just wanted to finish our work and go home. At 6pm, as we were leaving, his VW Bug was parked outside and he asked whether we want to go for coffee, and he especially seemed to want my sister to go. We told him thanks, but no thanks, even making out that we might join him another time. It was a straight up lie though, as he was thoroughly giving us the creeps by that stage. After he drove off in his Bug, we really didn't think of it again. Until the next year, when his picture appeared in the paper. His name wasn't Ted Smith. It was Bundy. Ted Bundy. As in THE Ted Bundy. I'm not kidding you. 
It still sends chills up my spine just to write about it, and Sis and I still talk about it occasionally. We were two lucky young women that day. If either of us had agreed to go, we would have been murdered, like the at least 30 other women Bundy had kidnapped. My mother and myself decided to visit Nevada City, Canada on a whim. It's an old-timey Victorian-era mining and logging town built in 1856. Look at a picture on Google if you really want to see a creepy town. It looks haunted without even having to try. After eating lunch at a brew pub, we decided to stroll around the massive Pioneer Historical Cemetery on the outskirts of town. It wasn't quite dusk, but the trees are really tall in this area, so daylight is hard to gauge, and it usually feels later than it is. This cemetery was sprawling. I mean, most pioneer cemeteries are because of the high mortality rate of the time. There are lots of child graves. As we progress through the cemetery, it starts like a proper cemetery with large ornate tombstones and mausoleums, marble obelisks and family plots, etc., but... That's what's wild about this cemetery is that it stretches on almost forever into the woods. Spooky, but this isn't a paranormal story. As we follow the cemetery deeper and deeper into the woods, it becomes harder to tell what's a grave or not, and it's getting more and more wild and overgrown. It eventually devolved into just wilderness, with the occasional sign of homeless camps like abandoned tents and bags of trash. Luckily, the trees were opening up and more daylight was coming through, and we ended up in an open area with a large, solitary juniper tree, tall brush, and a few random graves. I sort of tripped over something, and it turned out to be a purse, like a large designer purse, and it looked super old, like it had been there a while. Looking up from the purse about ten yards ahead, I saw what looked like a pile of women's clothing, but then I noticed to my horror a tangled mess of hair and I froze. Do you ever know something without actually knowing something? I knew that this was a dead woman's body, down to my core. I put a hand out and stopped my mom, who was trailing behind me. Get your phone. Call the police. That's a dead body over there. And she immediately started dialing 911 because, like me, she just knew. Then it gets bananas. As my mom and I are discussing the situation, we had our attention turned away from the corpse. When we look back at the body, I swear to God, she was sitting up with her back turned to us. She was wearing a bright red trench coat, and she had super grimy blonde hair that was more standing up than laying on her shoulders. It's like the grime in her hair allowed it to defy gravity. Slowly, she turned her head over her shoulder like something out of a horror movie and spotted us. She literally jumped to her feet, lightning fast, and turned to face us. Her front was a mess of torn clothing and she was barely covered. In the weirdest gait I've ever seen, she rapidly advanced on us in a jerking and lurching fashion. Her hands were desperately trying to keep herself covered. My first thought was that she had been assaulted or something. She kept trying to speak, but it was like she couldn't form words, only making short, high-pitched squeaks. As she closed on me, she stopped and pointed down in excitement at the purse that I had tripped over. I asked if it was hers, and when I did, her expression changed into a horrible smirk. It still haunts me, and suddenly, she was slowly starting to undress herself, and we had to shout to get her to stop. By this point, we had the cops on the way. We said that we had found someone in serious distress. Be that as it may, we both knew that this was not a safe situation for us, and we quickly backed away, turned, and just cooked it out of there. When we follow up with the police out of concern and morbid curiosity, they said whoever we found must have fled because they didn't find her. I hope to God that she's okay and gets the help that she desperately needs. I'm a 20-year-old female and I work part-time at a small business in my local mall and usually work alone. I'm a sales associate so I'm required to talk to customers and encourage them to buy things. It was the last hour of my shift when a creepy man came in. 
He was about mid-forties, and everything about him was just kind of odd. I.e. clothes didn't fit, expensive shoes, just socially awkward. He originally asked a pretty standard question about a less expensive item that I happily answered. After this, though, he continued to ask questions almost as if though he wanted to keep my attention on him. He then asked if he can try out our most expensive item in the store, which is a massage chair, and I say sure, we let everyone try it out. At this point, I just thought that he was an innocent yet socially awkward guy. He gets in the chair to try it out and continues to ask unusual questions. We chit-chat a bit and I tell him the massage chair's features and the price of it. All of a sudden, the questions get more personal. He asks what high school I went to and if I missed it. Me being naive, I said the high school I went to and that I don't miss going. He said some story about a teacher that I've never heard of and he said he missed high school a lot. He asked if I lived around there to which I avoided the question but implied that I lived close. He then repeatedly asked me the price of the chair and asked me to calculate the price along with our second most expensive item in the store. I thought he was fully interested and I was convinced that he was going to buy it. We make commission on the chair so I ignored his creepiness because I wanted to make the sale. He kept insisting that he needed to walk out with the chair today and that he has a truck that is big enough to hold it. It seemed that I had finally answered his questions to his liking because I was able to walk away a bit. He then made a phone call and started describing how I look, my age, where I live approximately, and what store I worked at. He then said to the person on the phone, We got one. We got one. I had suspicions that he was creepy, but this just about confirmed it. I asked him from behind the cashier's counter, You're not talking about me, right? He shook his head no. He then stood up from the chair and said that he'll not be buying the chair today. I was so scared and alone. No one else around me but me and him. And I ran to the back and grabbed all my stuff and pulled out my pocket knife. He then left the store and hung out right outside the only entrance slash exit. I didn't want to leave but I couldn't stay inside the mall. I waited for him to go out of sight then quickly locked the store doors and ran outside to my car. I called my manager and she said that I have to close the store properly, i.e. turn off the lights and count the register, so she told me to go into a nearby store in the mall and call a security escort. I did just that and was escorted back to the store to close up and was escorted back to my car with no further incident. I live in a city with one of the highest rates of human trafficking in the country. Do you think that I was potentially being targeted? Let me start off by saying I know how terribly dumb and naive I was for letting myself get into this situation. You know, sometimes I even laugh at how preposterous this whole thing was, and you can too. It is kind of funny at parts. However, at the same time I knew if I had been just a little dumber, I might not have been so lucky. It had all started a couple of years ago. I was a sophomore in high school, about 15 or 16 at the time, and I was hanging out with an extremely toxic and emotionally manipulative acquaintance, Holly, who let's just say they weren't shy on getting money from lucrative ways. Such ways included scamming older men for their money from fake dating profiles that she made of other girls in our grade she didn't like, stealing from her parents, and bumming off money and things from her other friends. She had been doing this for years, same age as Carter and I, and was a minor at the time, Sure, we could have been considered friends, but I was much closer to my best friend Carter. Carter had been best friends with Holly since freshman year, and honestly, the only reason I hung out with her was because Carter insisted on inviting her to our hangouts every time. Holly was not a good person, and I quietly put up with her antics. One day, she starts talking about her friend Sarah. Awesome, but honestly, I really didn't care, especially knowing Carter and her ditched me for her. I wasn't really paying attention to the story until Holly asked me if I wanted to sell my socks for money. What? And she smiles and proceeds to tell me how they found a super senior, I kid you not, who bought knee-high socks for $90. All Sarah had to do was wear them outside for an entire day. Yeah, the freak liked them sweaty, I guess. The only thing was the super senior insisted on meeting in person only. Holly laughed telling me that it was a little weird. 
Okay, red flag number one. Holly never really thought things were weird unless they were really messed up. Then she proceeds to tell me that this super senior, honestly I never got his name so I'll just call him Kyle, was trying to get in her house the entire time but finally gave up and left. You're probably thinking, pardon me? Who would be dumb enough to try and wrangle money from this freak? Me. I'm the idiot. All I really heard was $90 for a pair of old worn socks. I was in. Being the amazing friends they were, Holly and Carter just laughed and informed me that I would have to do it on my own since they had better things to do, whatever that meant. They gave me his Instagram handle and wished me luck. Well, we had a problem right off the bat. You see, I totaled my car just around a month before and had no vehicle of my own. American and a small town, so it was hard to get around without a car. Well, being the idiot that I was, and still am, decided, hey, let's just take my mom's car. Huge mistake. So I start messaging this Kyle on Instagram, explaining my situation and how I got in contact with him. I can't remember most of this conversation, but I can remember the guy being really insistent on meeting at his apartment complex. Red flag number two. Although I'm very stupid and naive at times, I had at least common sense. I brushed it off and suggested other areas, Starbucks parking lot, local park, etc. But this guy wasn't backing down. Finally, after much convincing, I get Kyle to agree to meet in a nearby park, right by his house, red flag number three. So I convince my mom to allow me to drive her car and I meet up with Kyle at the park. It's mostly deserted, but it's by a busy street, so I don't feel too uncomfortable. And that's when I met Kyle. He was a huge, fat, sweaty guy with a beard who reeked to God knows what, but think neckbeard type character. My guy was at least 19, but looked like he could be pushing in his mid-twenties by this point. And that's when I knew I made a big mistake, but there was no way I was going to say no to $90. I awkwardly greeted him, and formal pleasantries were exchanged. I don't remember much of this weird conversation other than a couple of highlights. Number one... The dude brought rope. It turns out that he was into bounding feet as well, and I was super creeped out. The dude then starts to tie my feet together after I mumbled a weak agreement. All I remember is I'm staring at the sun wishing I would die right then and there. Number two, this guy had the gall to call my feet ugly while rubbing and massaging them. That kind of hurt, not gonna lie. And number three, the dude was insistent almost straight up begging on showing me his knife collection back at home and he would pay me extra to come with him. Yeah, no, wasn't going to happen. I knew what that meant and my stupid self wanted no part of that. The highlights continued. Number four, the dude straight up sniffed my socks after I gave them to him. No shame whatsoever. Told me he liked the vinegar smell. It turns out the socks used to belong to my now deceased grandfather, I had just grabbed a random knee-high pair from my sock drawer. Number five, after refusing Kyle multiple times to come back to his house, he only gave me one-third price that we agreed on since I refused to come home with him. Whatever. I was disgusted and disturbed, so anyways, I just wanted to get out of there. After returning home and getting my butt chewed out by my mom, I told her the truth after she asked me why I took her car and I promptly blocked the guy and called my friends to tell them about the experience. Much to my surprise, Holly informed me about something she forgot to tell me about. Apparently the guy had made several threats of shooting up his high school's graduation and was very well known to the local police. Although I thought this was over and done with, my junior year of high school I received threatening and grotesque phone calls that I reported to the police. Carter and Holly were also called and threatened. While mine were more of an intimate nature, theirs involved being extremely specific slurs as Holly was black and Carter was gay and he even recited Holly's address. Although I never found out who did them and there was a good chance Holly could have orchestrated the whole thing herself, I can't help but wonder if Kyle was behind it. Looking back on the insanity of the decision making I had back as a young person, it turned out to be an insane story that I still regret. So this event happened over the weekend while I was home from college for my mom's birthday. On Saturday night, I had a couple of beers with my girlfriend who was spending the weekend at her house because my parents are kind of super chill and 
At about 12.30 a.m., a few minutes after my parents went to bed, I went to the back porch to grab a couple of more beers for myself and my girlfriend, who was waiting in the basement where we planned to watch Game of Thrones for a while before going to bed. I opened the back door and stepped onto the back porch. Immediately the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end and I felt like I was being watched from the tree line. My back porch overlooks the backyard which leads directly into a thick woods. I thought nothing of it at first because I always feel a little spooked going outside at night but as I opened the cooler, I heard it. In my mind it was unmistakable. The agonizing screams of what sounded like my next door neighbor and her teenage daughter. I won't say their names because of reddit creeps but what's even more terrifying is that I swear that they were screaming a very specific thing. Sam. Help us please Sam. Which is my name. Now I was drunk and already on edge so frankly I turned around without the beers and locked the door behind me as I went back inside. Then I heard my mom's voice calling from upstairs asking if I'd heard it. I responded yes and asked if she knew what it was. She didn't have a clear answer and could only speculate, but she knew for a fact that our neighbors were both inside their home. I work with disabled and vulnerable adults, and one time I was grabbing a drink with a friend Joe and he asked if I could work for his girlfriend Jane. Jane and I got on like a house on fire. She had some physical disabilities, but also some mental health issues leading to her being prescribed a raft of antipsychotics. Joe was particularly on top of Jane's meds as he was training to be a mental health nurse. He had me filling in sheets as I was working in a psych ward at their house rather than a private residence. Usually, I simply make sure that people I work with take their meds. Sometimes, if they're controlled drugs, I might need to fill in a tick box, but... He had full-on sheets that I was expected to fill in, as a nurse would. Over time, I realized how controlling Joe was, and how much he used Jane's mental health against her. Gradually, I realized that if he attended doctor's appointments with her, she would get an increase in meds. If I attended with her, this didn't happen. Joe was getting me stressed out with how useless he was saying I was not putting items back in the cupboards perfectly, making spelling mistakes or missing punctuation on the over-the-top med sheets. I didn't notice quite how off balance he was keeping me, but I was very stressed out. So stressed out, I had several episodes of insomnia. One of these episodes, the doctor concluded, had led to me hallucinating twice whilst awake. The doctor gave me sleeping pills and the hallucinations didn't come back. When I saw Joe hit Jane for the first time, I did have the wherewithal to call social services, but Jane claimed that it hadn't happened. Joe said I'd misunderstood what was going on and that I didn't have any right to interfere with their relationship. The first time Jane left, he claimed that I had undue influence over her and left me checking words I said in case I was somehow influencing her as a vulnerable person. When Joe pinned me to the wall by my throat because I tried to prevent him from hitting her, I knew that I needed to leave, so I mentally gave Jane until January to leave him and then I'd stop working there. I registered a complaint with Joe's nursing course about his treatment of the vulnerable. She left him before that Christmas. By June, without him influencing her doctors, she had been taken off all the psych meds and hadn't had an episode since she'd left. Almost as if though her successor wasn't present, her physical disabilities improved significantly as well in the years since she left. That's because of the lack of unnecessary psych meds in my opinion. I haven't worked for Jane in years as she moved away to marry a lovely bloke, but I do work for a young adult who is apprenticing in a workplace and for his first six months has me in the breakout area identifying anything a disability charity can provide for his access needs. His colleagues chat away to me on their breaks including one who is very proud of his daughter a nurse. The daughter has a colleague who at first used to provide fun tales for an idiot who came to work hungover. Then the colleague turned up to work, on a ward, whilst drunk or high. Then the colleague boasted about keeping an ex-girlfriend's interfering friend quiet by feeding her the girlfriend's drugs so she didn't call social services on him. The daughter has made a complaint. Then I got to see a photo of this colleague, and of course, 
It's Joe. And I'm stuck here thinking about those times I hallucinated due to insomnia. Or did he put something in my tea? I know this is not usually what people post here, but I don't know where else to post this. But for about three months, I've been experiencing hacking from what I assumed to be another tenant in my building. It began with hacking my Bluetooth speaker. I would be listening to something while doing housework, and the next thing I know, my device would be disconnected and the hacker would start playing very creepy and inappropriate music via my speaker. The main song that they would play is "Eft with an Anchor by Ailstorm a song I had never heard until this. If you choose to listen to the song, you'll see why this immediately freaked me out. I would try everything I could to turn it off, but they would put the volume at full and play it over and over again, and this happened on two separate occasions. After this, I stopped using my Bluetooth speaker to prevent this from happening again, until they hacked into my PlayStation and began playing the same song, again on full volume, and continued to play after I pressed the pause or exit my music app. I then unplugged my PlayStation and have not used it again. Finally, yesterday I had asked Google a question via my Google Nest device and straight after I heard a ding on the device, signaling someone else was controlling it, which is only possible if I grant access and is also the case with all the devices they had hacked so far. Straight after the ding, the hackers started playing creepy music again, different from the last time. It was an old song with a very creepy undertone and the only words I remember are, times are getting hard, boy. I straight away unplugged my device to stop the music and have stopped using the device altogether. The reason this had freaked me out more than the last few times is the fact that I was on the phone with a friend at the time, talking about some personal things I had going on. Therefore, I believe this hacker is able to hear me. I'm unsure whether this is due to them being a direct neighbor of mine or whether they have hacked my device to listen to me. I'm completely stumped with what to do now as I've contacted my landlord and all they said was they'd send out a warning email to all tenants, but I needed to contact my internet provider for further action. I should have mentioned this earlier, but I live in student accommodations and to make it cheaper, everyone uses the same Wi-Fi but have separate logins, so the reason it's so easy for them to hack into my device is due to us using the same Wi-Fi. I then contacted my internet provider and they said they can't do anything about it. I really don't know what to do anymore. I have now had to forfeit use of three separate devices to ensure this stops happening, but they continue to find a way to hack me. I feel incredibly unsafe and uneasy in my apartment, becoming paranoid someone is listening to me or watching me. I feel as if though I'm actually going crazy. I'm a 26-year-old female and I live in a flat building in a good area. It's long, windy cul-de-sac so there's not many cars coming in and out unless it's people leaving or coming home from work. My boyfriend is away to Thailand for a month and we usually take the dog out together at night. I went myself, which I was fine with. I'm usually feeling safe. Last week at around 8pm, I left the flat to take my dog for a pee. My dog is extremely excitable, especially around other people. She just had her spay surgery. She has a cone on her head and stitches that have to heal. I'm waiting for my dog to do her business and a car pulls in and drives slowly past me. The guy did a friendly neighborly nod towards me so I did a small smile back, you know, to be polite. The guy parks at the front of the building and I'm at the other side of the car park on the grass with my dog. I'm watching my dog, trying to get her to hurry up because it was freezing. I look up and the man has stood outside of his car, now staring at me. I felt freaked out by this and I turned my attention back to my dog. I keep looking over my shoulder and he's staring with this creepy smile on his face now. I looked away again for a second and he was walking around the road slowly toward us. I'm a really friendly person, I can be paranoid and aware as any woman should be at night but something about him made me feel scared. He's walking so slow, as if he wants to talk to me, so I hide behind a van, and I'm telling my dog to hurry up and pee. I can't see him anymore, which terrified the life out of me. All I hear are footsteps coming towards us. The guy peeks his face around the van. 
and my dog goes nuts. She's jumping around, barking aggressively, which she never does with people, and the guy doesn't take this as a reason to leave. My dog is showing that he doesn't want his presence, but even though she's doing this, he continues walking towards us slowly. I start backing up and say to him to please leave as she's just had surgery and she's too excited. In the most quiet, sinister voice, he asks, What's your name? I couldn't really hear him. He kept repeating the question. I eventually understood what he was saying, and my dog is still going absolutely nuts at him. I say again, Please, my, my dog just had surgery. I, you need to walk away. She's too excited. Ignored again, and he walks towards us, asking my name. So I start walking away from him, and he ponders for a minute, still smiling, creepily, may I add, and he eventually backs up slowly, still facing me. I swear he did this for at least 20 seconds. He walks back to his car, looking over his shoulder at me, then stands back at his car and stares for another three minutes. I pretend my dog is doing something when she's really just being a pain in the butt and just standing there, and I look up and he's gone. I'm shaking, sending my sister voice notes about what's going on, and she's telling me just go inside, but she doesn't realize that I'm legitimately paralyzed in fear. Eventually, I see a woman and her son rock up to the front door, so I gain control of myself and half jog over with my dog to go inside the same time as them. The front of our building has glass doors. I glance in and the man is standing there, seemingly waiting for us. I told the woman, This man's been following me and my dog. I'm scared. She walks in with me. The man sees that I'm not alone and walks right past us out of the building again. I run into the lift with my dog, get in and lock my doors. I decide to tell my two male neighbors about it as my boyfriend is away and they agree to run downstairs if I ever need them. I took a picture of his car and registration as my twin sister gets the train home late at night after work and I want her to be wary of him. Well, today I was out with my dog at 11am, just doing our usual walk around the block. We walk into the building and as we're heading to the lift, I see the guy peek his head around the corner. He was looking for me, and he started walking towards me. At first I didn't recognize him, but then he smiled his creepy smile and I realized who it was. He said, Hi. So I said hi, then beelined it for the lift. He came towards me and my dog again. I pressed the lift button, just watching it come down from the sixth floor. He comes and stands closer to me again, and my dog is going nuts at him. He asks what my name is, and he has kind of an accent. He asked again when I didn't understand what he was saying. I asked, What, my dog's name or, or mine? And he goes, y Yours. I froze and just said a fake name, and he started to move closer. I had no time to pay attention. The lift was about open and I could run away. He told me his name, and I just replied, Nice to meet you, and... Finally, the lift doors opened. I walked in and pressed the button to my floor, hoping he'd leave me alone. He ran behind me as I walked in and went, I, I'd like to see you again. Good God. Shivers ran down my spine. I was so creeped out. I just said that I had a boyfriend, but thanks. And as I said this, the lift doors were closing and he tried to stick his hand out to stop the lift from closing but thank God they closed on time. I'm only on the next floor up, so I was so afraid that he was going to run up as he could see what floor I got off at. I stopped for a moment and almost pressed a different floor, but I just wanted to get into my home and lock the doors. The lift opens, and he's not there, so I beeline to my front door. There's a glass door to the stairs, and I swear that I thought I saw someone coming up. I ran in and locked the front door. I was so confused by what had just happened. The next thing I do, I message everyone with the update, and they told me to phone the non-emergency police number, even just to get it on record, so I did that, and the police arrived to my flat at about 3pm. I explained everything to them, and they said that I could either A, get the police to go to his front door and tell him to knock it off, or B, next time he does something like that, tell him to leave me alone, and if he doesn't, 
phone the police as it would then actually be considered harassment. But for now, the police couldn't do more, which is fair enough. I didn't want to anger him at this stage as it's not a crime at this point, but why can't he just leave me alone? I clearly have shown that I'm not interested. It just annoys me so much that I can't even leave my house looking ugly without someone being desperate enough for any female in the immediate area, and especially going about it in the weird way that he has. Now, I hadn't seen the guy since the last incident. However, I saw him today. Again, was taking my dog out to the toilet at around 1 p.m. As soon as I left the main door, I look, and the guy is sitting in his car. He clocks me. I start walking past his car when he gets out and said hi to me. I completely ignored him and walked on by. I was preparing myself to shout at him if he kept following or talking to me. I went over to the grass and the guy is standing at his car, once again, staring. I'm a bit further away, so I text my sister letting her know that he was at his car watching me. She didn't reply, so I phoned one of my male neighbors, and he quickly got his shoes on and said that he was coming down the stairs. I look back at the man, and it seems as though he has his phone out, and he's recording me. I started shaking, working myself up to the point of confronting him and telling him to leave me alone. The next thing I know, my sister bolts out of the building and fast walks over to me and my dog. She said as soon as she came out of the building... She saw him back inside of his car with the car door fully open and his back was turned to her because he was watching me, so she saw it this time. He looked at her briefly and watched her walk over to me. He started staring at us both, and that's when my male neighbor gets outside and walked over to us. The man continued watching as I told them both that I think he was waiting for me to get back into the building because why was he just sitting there? My sister had had enough. So she told me and my neighbor to take the dog for a walk and stormed over to the guy's car. She said, excuse me, and he was shocked. She stood right in front of his car and explained that he needs to leave me alone, and I'm not interested. I told him the dog had surgery and he wouldn't leave, which is unacceptable. She also said that I had mentioned about my boyfriend, so he needs to leave me alone. He just nodded and mumbled a few times, and she said he even looked frightened. She walked back into the building, so we took the dog on a walk, and when we got back, the guy was gone. Probably got out of his car and ran back into his flat. I mean, he made me uncomfortable, so she did it to him. And now, if anything else happens, I'm phoning the police, as they would then say that it's harassment. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. When I was in my early 20s, me and some friends went to celebrate my birthday. We went to a couple of parties since it was the weekend, then bar hopped the rest of the night. While we were at a bar, we met a group of guys that offered to buy us drinks. No biggie, and heck yeah, and it was my birthday. We danced around with them for a bit before retreating back to our little section. One of the guys came over to our section and asked me to dance again. I told him maybe in a bit and went back to partying with my girl. We didn't see them again until the club closed. The group of guys came over to us and, of course, were trying to find someone to go home with. The same guy that approached me earlier had approached me again. I laughed it off and thanked him for a good time. By this time, we were all getting in the car. We had a designated driver and they made sure each of us got home safe after the club. Now, three nights later, me and my then-boyfriend were knocked out as I had worked the next morning. My boyfriend worked nights, but he was off this night. It's 3.41 a.m., and there's a knock at the door. My boyfriend goes to answer it, and I'm walking behind him, wondering who could possibly be at the door at that time of night. We lived in a not-so-good area, so the porch lights would work when they wanted to, and now wasn't one of those times. As my boyfriend opens the door, the person at the door says, Excuse me, ma'am, I can't get my car to start. And as he looks up, I immediately recognized him as the man from the club. I scream, and my boyfriend catches on and closes the door. Me and him had a few laughs when I told him about the guy at the club, so when I told him that was him, he opened the door back, I guess to confront him, but he was gone. We hadn't seen a car, but again, it was dark. I don't know how this man found where I live, other than following us home that night. 
I still get the chills thinking about what may have happened if my boyfriend wasn't there that night. Yesterday, while returning home from work, I was exhausted and strayed from my routine way back home, and I decided to sit down on the bench at a small park. The park was empty at the time. About five minutes later, a young man, I'd say he was in his late 20s to early 30s, dressed in a business suit holding a briefcase, sat on the bench across from me and started to occasionally stare at me. Later on, he got up and sat next to me on the bench and said, How are you, Jennifer? Now, Jennifer's obviously not my real name, but he had a British accent and he was speaking in a very exaggerated manner. He was surprised and thought that this was someone from college or high school that I didn't remember at the time, and when I asked how he knew my name, he simply replied, Oh, it doesn't matter. And then put his briefcase to his lap and clasped his hands on top of the briefcase. At this point, I started to feel worried and asked him again how he knew me, but before I could finish my sentence, he interrupted me and said, I'll get into that a little while later, but first, let me ask you, are you satisfied with where you're living at right now? And then just said my entire address. He then said, what are your thoughts on your workplace? Are you satisfied with your wage? And then he correctly stated my exact wage. At this point, I started to get really creeped out by him and asked him who he was again, and he calmly replied, It doesn't matter at this point and moment. I, right now, what matters is that I want to help you. He then went on to state a lot of personal information about me and that I would think no one would ever know, and he especially knew a lot about my personal relationships about people that I know. As he was saying all of this stuff, I started to pack my things and get up from the bench and asked who he was and what he wanted in a worried manner. He didn't answer me and told me to calm down. I then yelled at him, asking him what in God's name he wanted from me and who he was. And he didn't say anything and he did this very weird thing where he rolled his eyes first and then slowly turned his head behind as if to say someone was standing behind him and just said, Very well then. The way he did that was really strange, like almost as if though he was a character giving the camera a side eye and breaking the fourth wall. He picked up his briefcase, got up from the bench, and started to approach me. I tried to reach for the pepper spray in my bag, but he grabbed my arm and said, No need for that. Pushing me away, and I lost my balance and fell to the ground, and he then quickly walked away. I was really scared after falling to the ground and didn't know what to do for a solid minute. When I got back up, I went the way that he walked away, but I didn't see him and decided to just get out of the park and go home. Overall, his mannerisms were really strange, and he used his hands in this elegant manner a lot when he talked, like as if though he was a theatrical actor, and as I stated before, he did speak in a sort of nice British accent, and I live in the United States. He was really tall, very well-dressed, clean-shaven, had short, slicked hair, and was wearing circular glasses. Another detail that I noticed was that he had this square pin on the lapel of his blazer. The pin was white and had a little black trinket on it. I haven't went to the police yet, and I intend to ASAP, but I really don't know what to say or what evidence to provide apart from a small wound on my hand. Is there a place where I can ask some advice about what to do about this situation? Also, I apologize for the way I wrote this. My mind is a mess right now. My mom was an avid conspiracy podcast listener when my brother and I were growing up. She used to listen to Coast to Coast podcasts on alien conspiracies and would talk about recent UFO sightings and stuff like that. Anyways, because of this... My mom decided to tell my dad, my brother, and me an incredible secret one-word code that would only be used to verify that we are who we say we are in case of time travel or something crazy like that. It's a pretty unique word, if you can even call it that, that is almost inconceivable to be mentioned in regular conversation. We all thought it was pretty corny, but we all agreed to remember it and all of us talk about the code and conversation every once in a while. Now note that 
My mom came up with this code word several years after we had moved away to a different state, California, from our hometown of Illinois. Fast forward to last year, a tradition of our family is to go back to our hometown for Thanksgiving every year, and my dad's and uncle's birthday is within that week, so we usually celebrate their birthday during this week as well. We decided, since it was my father's 50th birthday, that we go to a dive bar with my family and my parents' high school friends. Vibes were great, and it was the first time our whole family had been out together for several years. About an hour in, a late 60s to early 70s man wearing a bar staff shirt came up to me, my brother, and my mom and said this incredibly secret aforementioned family code. The way he said it was so deliberate, it was like he knew how much the code meant to my family. We all looked at each other with very perplexing gazes, like we all wanted to say WTF to each other, but as soon as we looked at each other, he went over to where he was sitting prior to this incident. My brother went over to talk to him a few minutes later, but I forget what he said to him. Nothing noteworthy, if I recall, but I'll update this post on what he said to my brother during this encounter when I ask him. Later that night, he and my dad were outside smoking and gave my dad a rock. It was a dark brown rock with dark orange streaks passing through the rock. I think my dad gave it to my mom and my mom threw it away, but I'll update the post with an image of it if she still has it. My mom believed that the rock was some sort of bad omen. I kid you not, this really did happen. My brother and I think it's a clever prank that my mom has pulled, but she usually cracks when this happens and we ask her a few times. I would think she wouldn't joke about this in the first place, but it's the only logical thing that we could possibly come up with. Even the day following, my brother and I asked my mom about this incident and she remained very adamant about her having no involvement in this. My dad isn't the prank pulling kind of guy and wasn't even there to see it go down. No negative connotation, but it's just not in his nature to ask a stranger to do something like that, so it eliminates him from doing something like this. We asked him anyway, and to no surprise, he said he had no involvement. I know this seems incredibly unbelievable, and I agree, it totally does, but it did happen, and it's a creepy interaction we'll likely never forget. I'm not a believer in the supernatural, but if I did think it was just a prank, I wouldn't have spent time posting it here. Hi friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra bonus content for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to take a walk to the Bach.